Hi, and welcome to another edition of Your Health with Dr. Christy. My name is Dr. Christy Reisinger, and this is the second part of a three-part series about the importance of sleep. In the first part, released just a few days ago, I discussed the overall benefits of sleep to your health. Today, we will discuss the genetics of sleep and the dangers of sleep deprivation. The third part will be about treatments for insomnia. All of this information is based on a fascinating book I recently read called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. I highly recommend the book. It's helped me to understand further the importance of sleep to overall health and wellness. So first, let's start off by discussing what determines when we wake and when we sleep. We may have all heard about circadian rhythm, but also sleep pressure caused by the hormone adenosine building up throughout the day also helps our bodies to know when it's time to sleep. But interestingly enough, people have different peaks and troughs of wakefulness, and they're different. So early risers comprise about 40% of the population, and night owls comprise about 30% of the population, and those that are in between comprise about 30%. These peaks and troughs are determined by genetics, but unfortunately, night owls are often forced to burn the candle at both ends. They're often seen staying up late because that's just their normal rhythm, but then they have to get up early and tend to have higher rates of depression, anxiety, diabetes, cancer, heart attacks, and stroke because of it. Furthermore, anyone with children knows that they have an earlier circadian rhythm, while as they move towards adolescence, their rhythm shifts forward. My 12-year-old has been known to stay up until midnight, only to sleep until 10 a.m. the next day. But I learned from the book that instead of shaming him about this, I need to understand that adolescents need more sleep than adults, and they're biologically wired to obtain that sleep at different times. And trying to make them fit into my sleep schedule is a losing battle. But as we move into the later years, sleep can become more difficult with age. Well, why? Well, we know that older adults can suffer from sleep fragmentation or sleep disruptions that can often be from bladder issues and from decreased sleep efficiency. Let me explain that a bit further. Your sleep efficiency is 100% when you're in bed eight hours and you get eight hours of sleep. But with age, our sleep efficiency reduces to about 70 to 80%. Now that doesn't sound terrible until you realize that if you're in the bed eight hours, you lie awake 90 minutes, which can be very frustrating for older adults and tends to be a common complaint in my older patient population. As seniors age, their sleep timing often shifts earlier in contrast to what we see in adolescents. And in older adults, their bodies tell them that they need to go to bed earlier. But instead of doing that, they may doze off in the evening, which then reduces their sleep pressure, and later this can contribute to difficulty sleeping when they're really ready to go to sleep. We'll talk more about sleep treatments in my next episode, but for seniors, melatonin may be helpful, and also making sure that they limit sunlight exposure in the morning. But we recommend exposure to lots of sunlight later in the day which can potentially help to delay the evening release of melatonin. So a question that I want each of you to ask yourself is, are you getting enough sleep? There are four questions that you can ask yourself to help determine this. Number one, after waking up in the morning, could you fall back asleep at 10 or 11 a.m.? Number two, can you function optimally without caffeine before noon? Number three, if you didn't set an alarm, would you sleep past that time? And number four, do you have difficulty reading something and understanding it at work? Let's shift to the dangers of sleep deprivation and they're real and scary. Did y'all know that the smallest dose of sleep deprivation obliterates concentration? I'm sure we've all experienced this at work. Vehicular accidents caused by drowsy driving exceed those caused by alcohol and drugs combined. I know that when I was working as a resident, 80 plus hours a week, I fell asleep in my car at a stoplight on the way home from a long shift. So I know firsthand the dangers of driving while drowsy. One study showed that after being awake for 19 hours, people were as cognitively impaired as those who were legally drunk. And after 16 hours of being awake, the brain just simply begins to shut down. 
Humans need more than seven hours of sleep each night to maintain cognitive performance. And the maximum sleep pressure for people is thought to occur after about 12 to 16 hours of being awake. One study that I thought was really interesting asked participants to press a button in response to a light for 10 minutes every day for 14 days with a variable amount of sleep. After four hours of sleep for six nights, participants' performance was as bad as those who had not slept for 24 hours straight. 10 days of six hours of sleep a night caused an impairment in performance as going without sleep for 24 hours straight. I often hear people say, well, I don't need more than six hours of sleep a night. Well, I would push back and say that people consistently underestimate their degree of performance disability and chronic sleep restriction over months or years can cause a person to acclimate to their impaired performance, lower alertness, and reduced energy levels. Dr. Walker speaks about this a lot in his book. The sleepless elite are very rare. These people, when given hours and hours of sleep opportunity, still only sleep six hours or less a night. This is just a fraction of 1% of the population that truly need less sleep than the recommendations. I also want to say that sleep deprivation is not insomnia. So what is insomnia? Insomnia is an inadequate ability to generate sleep despite giving oneself an adequate opportunity to get sleep. It needs to occur more than three times a week for more than three months to have a diagnosis of insomnia. It's two times as common in women than men. It's more common in African Americans and Hispanics and whites. Did you know the sleep aid industry is worth $30 billion in the United States? That should also let us know that there's a problem happening in our country. The two most common triggers for insomnia are worry and anxiety. And Dr. Walker talks about how worry and anxiety raise our heart rate and core temperature. And both of these things need to be lowered in order to initiate sleep. In patients that are able to sleep normally, the areas of the brain that are responsible for emotion and memory ramp down before sleep. But in patients that struggle with insomnia, those areas of the brain remain active. In sleep deprivation studies in rats, death occurred as quickly from sleep deprivation as it did from total food deprivation. And selective REM deprivation caused death almost as quickly as total sleep deprivation, which shows the importance of REM sleep. Rats that were sleep deprived ate more calories yet still lost weight. They could no longer regulate their core body temperature, they developed sores on their body, and they eventually died from septicemia, or bacteria in the blood from the gut. These are scary consequences for sleep deprivation I encourage each one of you to take a look at your own sleep habits and see if there are things that you could work on. In my next episode, we'll talk more about treatments for insomnia. I hope you'll join me. Thanks again.